all these diseases like heart disease, diabetes, cancer, dementia, which are the common things that kill people, kidney disease, high blood pressure, which are all metabolic diseases. They're all diseases of, of the same fundamental mechanisms in the body, which we are treating all separately. Hello, hello, friends. It's going to be a great day. You know why? Because Dr. Mark Hyman's on and he's going to teach us how to be healthier. Oh, such a good episode. All right, let's go to our quote of the day. We must learn to treat the person, not the disease, not the system, not just the symptoms. This is personalized medicine, the medicine of the future. That is from, as I said, Dr. Mark Hyman, the author of Young Forever, The Secrets to Living Your Longest, Healthiest Life. Friends, it is an amazing day. When you have Dr. Mark Hyman on, he has gone through it himself. He's healed himself of so many different things. And he's going to share with us how we can do the same. I've seen as a patient, the challenges that we face in the medical system as it is in its current state and, (laughs) and the things that the, you know, the normal person who's just being diagnosed with their first thing doesn't understand. And the specialties are so frustrating. You know, it's like, I I actually recently drew a diagram in one of their offices. I go, here's the list of stuff. (laughs) How do we get to the root of what's happening here? Because clearly there's something autoimmune and clearly there's something hormonal. And they look at me like... Like you're from another planet, yeah. And then they just move on quickly because that's not what they're trained to do. Do you have an Mm. eloquent way... Mark, of explaining the medical Mm. system's flaws Mm. because it's how they're Mm. trained. It's not that the doctors have bad intentions. And so I'd love to start there because I feel like one of my missions in this world is to share this with people. Yeah, I think most people go to the doctor and the doctor is practicing a type of medicine that's really outdated. It's based on old ideas about how the body's organized, which is based on specialties and organs and parts of your body. The body is one whole integrated system. And unless you understand how to optimize that system, you can't create health. And most of medicine is focused on treating disease as opposed to understanding health and how to turn on all the innate healing systems we have in our body, which are really remarkable and can actually activate processes that reverse our biological age and reverse so many chronic diseases if we know how to activate them. And so since they don't know that, what happens to the average person is (laughs) you go to the doctor and they stick to their specialty. Your primary will send you to specialists. And, you know, there's even like examples of patients that came to you. Um, I probably won't be able to find it that fast because I've marked so many pages in here. But I can share it. Yeah, there's the woman who came in and she has on all different pills from all the different specialists. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's quite amazing. Here's a great, a great case of a patient we had at Cleveland Clinic, you know, who was seeing the best doctors for a whole host of complicated problems. She's about a 50-year-old woman, an executive business coach, uh, you know, very smart and struggling. She was uh, struggling with psoriatic arthritis, which is a horrible skin condition that also affects your joints. So it's like rheumatoid arthritis. And she was on a drug that cost $50,000 a year and suppressed her immune system. She had terrible reflux, heartburn, irritable bowel, bloating. She had depression. She had pre-diabetes, she was overweight, uh, she had migraines, couldn't sleep well. And she was seeing all these doctors. She saw a psychiatrist for depression, a gastroenterologist for her gut and reflux and neural valve. She saw a rheumatologist for psoriatic arthritis and she was getting all the best treatments, but she was being managed. They were just managing her symptoms. And they weren't dealing with the root cause. And from a functional medicine perspective, which is all about root cause medicine, it was very clear to me that she had a whole host of problems that were all inflammatory. Her gut was inflamed. Her, obviously, her skin, her joints are inflamed. Depression is inflammation of the brain. Prediabetes is inflammation of your metabolism. And so I said, well, what's causing the inflammation? Well, it turned out it was her gut. She had really bad overgrowth of bacteria, overgrowth of yeast. She had leaky gut. She had food sensitivity. So we basically cleaned up her diet, put her on the diet, basically that I talked about in Young Forever, which is a whole foods, plant-rich diet with lots of, um, you know, phytochemicals, but we also removed the sugar and the starch, got rid of the inflammatory foods, gluten, dairy, and many other things. And within six weeks, she came back and I thought, oh, you know, when I gave her maybe a multivitamin, uh, vitamin D, probiotics, fish oil, very simple by supplement regimen. She came back uh, six weeks later after treating her gut and cleaning up her diet and giving her a few supplements 
completely off every medication, which I did not tell her to do. I told her to stay on it. <laughs> she had no more psoriatic arthritis, no more heartburn, no more reflux, no more irritable bowel, no more depression, no more insomnia. And she lost 20 pounds and reversed her prediabetes. By treating the system, we were able to do that. By treating symptoms and by treating the diseases, conventional medicine just can't get there from here. Yeah. And so, I mean, you obviously wrote this book, Young Forever, and you're sharing all of the secrets mm. to living your longest and healthiest life. But how do we, and, and, and do you have plans to try and fix the system? Because it's really scary. People are getting sicker and they're dying unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. You talk mm -hmm. about it in the book too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, in addition to my work as a physician and practicing doctor and author, uh, I actually uh, started a nonprofit to educate lawmakers and change policy. And we're actually going to be having hearings from the Health Subcommittee and the Ways and Means Committee to discuss this problem of chronic disease and nutrition. Uh, our, our nonprofit helped establish a new entity within the government to coordinate all nutrition policies, which were not coordinated, every, and how they impact chronic disease in the economy. So that's a huge step forward to pass the Senate and the House. So we're moving forward. We got $2 million for a food as medicine pilot program. We're working on a $500 million medically tailored meals bill. So we're going we're gonna to be able to move the ball down the field by using food as medicine and transforming people's biology by what they eat, which is the most important thing that they do every day to control their health and well-being. That's amazing. We need that. I remember um, I was an ambassador for the diabetes program for Entertainment Industry Foundation. And when mm. we went to Capitol Hill and we were talking to all the lawmakers, we were like, all of the diseases are affected in similar ways and yeah. they're separating all the money. And if you actually combine the money, you could do so much more. Um, one of my favorite quotes on this show was from you. And it was one oh. of our last interviews where you said, when you go through the supermarket, pretend like you're yeah. at the pharmacy. The pharmacy. And <laughs> exactly, exactly. That stuck with me. And with so an F, now. F -A -R -M -A -C -Y. <laughs> Yeah. And, and I just, it stuck with me and I've since quit sugar and quit gluten and quit all of these things. And I'm having a lot of great, great results because of yeah. it. Um, but you know, yeah, yeah it, it really is. But you know, when you start the book, you're talking about so many horrendous statistics of chronic diseases and how many people, um, are suffering from one and two. Can you give us some of those um, I mean, listen, you know, what we see, uh, and, and the reason I wrote Young Forever was to help people understand that what we see around us is abnormal aging. We see people de have declined, decrepitude, disability, uh, loss of function, and all these diseases like heart disease, diabetes, cancer, dementia, which are the common things that kill people, kidney disease, high blood pressure, which are all metabolic diseases. They're all diseases of, of the same fundamental mechanisms in the body, which we are treating all separately. And so we see, you know, people over 65, probably over 80% of them have one or more chronic illnesses. And, and what we've done in medicine is treat them all individually. That's what the NIH has studied all these, you know, that's, we're spending 6 billion on cancer research and billions on heart disease research and billions on diabetes research instead of treating the root cause, which are what we call the hallmarks of aging. So in the, in the book, I really described how what we think of as normal aging is really abnormal aging. It's really a disease process. And it's based on understanding these fundamental things that go wrong. We call the 10 hallmarks of aging. And the good news is that, that if you were to correct the problems with those hallmarks, you wouldn't just get a five or seven year life extension, which you would if you cured, for example, heart disease and cancer off the face of the planet, we'd get maybe five to seven years. But by addressing these hallmarks, we might get 30 or 40 years of life extension, which means for an average person living to 120 years old. There's no reason anybody alive today can't get to 100 years old in good health if they understand their body's system and how to work with it rather than against it, how to activate these ancient embedded longevity switches, these pathways and healing systems that repair, regenerate, renew our biology, and that we are doing all the things to screw it up instead of all the things to actually turn on the longevity genes, turn on the, the genes that help us to re reverse any metabolic damage and to optimize these basic systems in the body, which is sort of the whole purpose of the book is what do we know scientifically? What does the science of longevity tell us? What, is, what are the practical tools that we can use step-by-step step to activate these ancient healing systems and make our bodies literally reverse our biological age. You know, I'm 63, I can't change that. I was born in 1959, that's just gonna go on and on. But I can change my biological age. And I'm not 
63 biologically. I'm 43, according to Are you new really? kinds of diagnostic tests that we can use. Yeah, to measure our biological age. Uh, which Those is are DNA so cool. I testing. did one yeah. as well. And yeah. I think I was only like a year younger. So that's not good. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> there's this guy that's spending $2 million a year. And he got about a five-year reversal. So I don't know. I, I spent a lot less than $2 million a year. And I, I think I'm good. But it's really about understanding the bio, principles of biology. It's like if you want to plant a garden, if you want to you know, raise a racehorse that's going to win a race, you have to understand how those uh, either plant systems or how those animals function to optimize their health. We don't do that. I mean, we you wouldn't think of of of, of you know feeding a million dollar racehorse a Big Mac fries and a Coke, right? Nope. You just wouldn't no. think of it. No, and we're yeah. insane. Yeah, we're insane. We it really is, are. It is I insane. wonder though, with your biological age, because I did that test, like I said, did you do it and have um, less? You know, did you have a, an age reversal after you did all the changes? Right. So now you're at a twenty year. Mm. um difference yeah. where were you the it's first so, time you did it yeah so i actually i've just done it once uh, oh. and i did it you know doing all the things i've done over years to actually okay. help optimize my health so i'm trying to get down maybe to 25 so i'm trying a bunch of new stuff we'll see okay. how it goes i'll report back but i'm, I'm looking to get at least down <laughs> to 30 something you know for sure maybe 20 something <laughs> i love it when i did it i was in the the middle of kind of a, a health disaster over the summer and so she, my naturopath at the time, thought that it was going to be way worse. And so I'm now wondering how much better it will get with all of the things yeah, that I'm doing and the sure. changes I'm making. For sure. Um, what I also love about this book is the title's a little deceiving yeah. because I thought it was like you wanting to live, you know, to 150 and it was just about like specifically aging, even though it is about aging, yeah, it's someone like really. me <laughs> who's going through so many health things right now is, is getting so much from it that I'm like, Oh, I can try that. I can try this. I'll add yeah. turmeric and I'll add this into my diet. Oh, the green tea I'm having, maybe it's not organic. I should be checking to make sure it's organic. There were so many things in this, but I also, I love the, the, uh, blue zones. We just had Dan on the show. Mm -hmm. We talked about the blue mm -hmm. zone diets. Mm -hmm. Um, the goal is, and you said it quickly, is to live healthier longer, yeah. you yeah. know, because I, you spoke to me instantly in the book when you were like, most people, when they say, do you want to live, you know, long, you're like, ew, the thought of that sounds awful because we just exactly. think of a million exactly. doctor appointments, canes, you yeah, know, okay. the whole thing and, well, and like the suffering, but it doesn't have to be like that. My dad's 77 and he's still building houses, still yeah climbing ladders totally. still a beast totally. but he's from a blue zone technically <laughs> it's true we look or like, the area know, i mean yeah for sure i mean you, you know you look at people who stay connected engaged and alive in their work i mean it's, it's impressive to see how vital you can be well into your 80s 90s and beyond i mean they're you know in the blue zones these guys were you know 100 years old and they were just straight upright walking fit the shepherds it was amazing to see I'm like wow this is like a different view of a 100 year old person riding their horse and doing their garden and working hard and you know just life and being not put out to pasture but being an integral part of the community i think that's a, it's a really big factor and i think what you said is right maria the book is is kind of a trick yes it's about understanding how your bodies work to increase your health span and and have it equal your lifespan meaning most people spend the last 20 years or 20 percent of their life in poor health and so you want to make that poor health time short and have you know really as long as you live be healthy and then just kind of die at some point and and the reality is that we you know we we can do that by following the guidelines in the book but what's really to me more important is that it's a roadmap to how your body works and how to create mm -hmm. health no matter where you are and so the things that i describe in the book are designed to create optimal gut function and optimal nutritional status and optimal mitochondrial function, optimal hormone balance, optimal structural system and muscle mass. I mean, every single system in your body, we teach you how to identify where the imbalances are and how to optimize it. So that will do both extend your life and make your life healthier, but it'll also improve any current issues you have now because it's really about optimizing your health. And when you create health, disease goes away as a side effect. So with that woman I talked about earlier, I didn't treat her diseases. I wasn't treating all the different six or seven different diseases. I simply was helping her body get healthy. I helped her microbiome get healthy. I helped cool off inflammation. I took out inflammatory stuff. I put in anti-inflammatory stuff in her diet. And she was able to have her body do the work. It wasn't like I cured her. Her body's intelligence wants to create health. 
And we just interfere with that all the time. And in the book, I talk about how we're either dying too much or dying in too little. Like dying of too much of the bad stuff and not enough of the good stuff. Too much toxins, allergens, microbes, stress, poor diet, and not enough of the good nutrition and nutrients and light, air, water, you know, the right kind of exercise, sleep, relaxation, connection, community, meaning, purpose. These are all the ingredients for health. So ultimately the body is, is like any other living system. It requires certain ingredients and then other things it doesn't agree with. So you have to get rid of those or keep those at a low level. So the body has an amazing power to heal. And that's what's so exciting to me that I've seen over and over for almost 40 years of being a doctor. Yeah, well, it's inspiring, like I said at the beginning, when you see that you've gone through your own health crises that you've had to address and fix. And and there was a list. I mean, I'd love for you to share with oh, yeah. everybody because <laughs> when we get the lists, sometimes it can be so daunting yeah. and depressing. You're like, yeah. how, how how can I climb out of this? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I joke. I say I'm a holistic doctor because I take care of people with a whole list of problems. And I for sure have a whole <laughs> list of problems. <laughs> I, I mean, I developed chronic fatigue syndrome. My uh, system completely broke down. My gut broke down. I had you know, terrible diarrhea and, and bloating. I had terrible immune issues. I would get sores all over my tongue, rash all over my body. I had severe brain fog. I couldn't remember anything. I couldn't focus. I had really struggled um, with mood issues, sleep issues. So many things went wrong. My muscles started being damaged. I could Mold. Just severe muscle pain. And it was really, you know, because of a number of things that I uncovered over time. I had mercury poisoning from living in China and other things. I, I then got, you know, Lyme disease and babesia and mold toxicity. And I took an antibiotic at one point later on. I, I just kind of keep getting this stuff that, you know, causes autoimmune disease. And so I basically have to figure stuff out for myself on how to heal. You and that's, said you had autoimmune yeah. stuff. What were mm. your autoimmune diseases? Well, I mean, that was not that long ago, actually, about you know, five, six years ago, um, maybe a little longer. I had um, an antibiotic for a bad tooth and root canal that got pulled out. And that caused a bacterial infection called C. diff, which is a horrible thing that kills 30,000 people a year. Didn't kill me, but almost did. <laughs> yeah. And then I developed the consequence of that. I developed a, uh, ulcerative colitis. And was sick for five months oh. until I kind of really figured out what I needed to do to reset based on functional medicine and some of the principles that I talk about in Young Forever. Isn't it harder when you have to help yourself, though? Well, I mean, at the beginning, when I first started this over 30 years ago, I mean, there, this was a new frontier. And so I was basically, you know, like Lewis and Clark uh, on an expedition across the country where no one had been before and was trying to sort out how to fix everything. Now yeah. I have a much better map and a much better strategy and the uh, operating system of functional medicine has been so much more developed and we have really clear pathway on how to optimize our health and deal with chronic things. So once I, once I, you know, kind of learn what to do, it's the the iterations of getting better a lot faster. Although I'm not planning yeah. any sick anymore. So no, I hope I'm done for now. Oh my gosh. But I feel like it's, it's one of those things where it happens to those of us that have to keep sharing unfortunately. Um, but I, I wonder with the, um, the mold, what specifically yeah. did you do to, cause I feel like I'm hearing more and more people dealing with oh, mold yeah. toxicity. I mean, listen, half of all homes have some level of water damage. Some people are more sensitive than others. Part of it has to do with genetics. I, I happen to be very sensitive and, and it led to, you know, a chronic cough and fatigue and brain fog. And then set my immune system in this chronic state of inflammation. And so when I had this antibiotic, it just kind of tipped me over and I kind of went into this spiral of inflammation and and it was really bad. <laughs> and I had to literally gut my barn. I live in an old barn, which is probably, probably, probably part of the problem. It's like a 120 year old barn and I uh, had to gut it and get the mold out and redo it. And so wow. it was it was a journey, but I, I, I think it's not that bad for everybody. There's ways to deal with it through, um, you know, getting rid of the exposure number one that's the number one two and three thing you have to do two is there's binders and any fungals and various ways of detoxifying ozone can be helpful and i talk about that for inflammatory stuff plasma yeah. free system another thing i talk about in the book which is i saw the ozone therapy strategy. it's funny my husband just did this machine called hawk ozone therapy mm -hmm. yeah and you it's sit a, in it like, yeah, a, body, like yeah. yeah yeah does that do the same thing it can be very helpful like it's not as obviously potent as going intravenously but it can definitely help uh, get ozone in your system and help reduce some of the inflammation. And yeah, for sure. That was a big, that was a big factor for me in getting better. Interesting. Yeah. Well, cause when I saw all the intravenous stuff and the, there was a rectal one too, I'm like, wait, 
this isn't like that. I wonder, you no, know, no, and also again, I didn't include that in the book, but yeah, you can, you can. That was on saunas, yeah, for sure. Got it. Um, you also talk about hyperbaric chambers since we're talking about machines right now. Yeah. Um, and yeah. hyperbaric chambers have always scared me. When my mom had brain cancer, it was the one thing I was so hesitant on giving her. So oh, really? I yeah. wonder what research you have done on whether it really does spread cancer or not. I mean, that's a good question. I, I don't think it does. I mean, cancer typically is, you know, it doesn't like too much oxygen. So I think, you know, really the, the, the spread of cancer in the hyperbarics is a theoretical concept. I, I don't know if there's much evidence to show that that's true. I do, I do think that, that the hyperbaric therapy is very effective for um, longevity. You can get the data out of, out of Israel. They did, experiments where they took uh older people and they gave them you know i think it was 60 sessions over 90 days and a certain you know diet depth and a certain protocol and they were able to extend the telomeres which is one of the things that goes wrong as we age these little caps at the end of our, our chrom chromosomes that become sort of shorter as we age um are rather predictive of, of your of your age status and longevity and they're able to actually lengthen telomeres more than any other intervention they were all also able to kill zombie cells another one of the hallmarks of aging is telomeres is and the zombie cells are these kind of cells that don't die when your cells are done with their thing they're supposed to die but these are zombie cells they don't die and then they become these uh, sources of chronic inflammation throughout the body and they just spread this inflammatory kind of soup all over the place and that causes accelerated aging and more zombie cells and the hyperbaric oxygen kills zombie cells more than any other treatment they call it senolytics so wow. senescence is aging and senolytic means to cut aging <laughs> so that's, that's why they call it senolytic but it's a it's a really powerful therapy and it also helps repair the brain increase circulation here you know injuries a lot of athletes use it it's used for you know certain wound healing for stroke victims uh, brain injuries it can be extraordinarily powerful Oh my God, we have zombies inside of us. <laughs> we do, we do, we do, we do, we do. Oh, zombie cells. Okay. But we can kill them with the right foods and the right uh, strategies for sure. So I'm going to ask you an even more direct question. Um, if you had cancer right now, would you experiment with hyperbaric? I mean, there's a lot of things that I would do first. So it's probably not top of the list. And I think it's, it's I wouldn't probably you know rush to do that i would i would focus on the things that we know are effective for cancer whether it's ketogenic diets whether it's um, approaches that include you know a combination of conventional and other therapies that are being used for for cancer so i think um you know cancer therapy is undergoing a real kind of revolution uh the the clash slash burn and poison strategy is kind of archaic i mean you still need to do sometimes surgery and chemo and radiation but i think uh there are such amazing new options out there for people well optimizing the immune system is important that's what i found mm -hmm. in helping with my mom you know the the body's already ravaged by mm -hmm. the cancer then we give it this other toxin called chemo and now you're just yeah. totally weak so we would the second she was done with chemo, rev up her immune system with high dose vitamin C drips and antioxidants and all these things um, to help her. So since we're, I can't not ask for people who are listening, what are your favorite treatments um, on this side of the fence for cancer? Well, I, th I think, uh, I mean, the best stuff for cancer is, is to really focus on optimizing your overall health, your mindset, your immune system, your microbiome, your diet. And it's really all the steps that I lay out in the book, which are designed to not just treat cancer, but to prevent heart disease, diabetes, dementia, and cancer. And they they both can prevent and even help to be involved in the treatment and reversal of these problems. So I, I think it's it's important to realize that we have we have a lot of tools. Um, I also think they're like, like vitamin D and the right kind of uh, certain foods can be very helpful, like mushrooms are amazing for cancer. And so there's a lot of things you can start to eat and include in your diet, getting rid of sugar and starch. That's sort of number one. If you want to want to look at how to starve the cancer cells, don't feed them sugar and starch. Yeah, that's what I did with my mom too. I actually put her on the ketogenic diet right when mm -hmm. it was kind of first popping. Yep. And uh, they kind of laughed at me. And then three years in, even the doctors were doing no, for it. Sure. For sure, for <laughs> and then sure, they were like sure. you're not gonna believe this but people are actually shrinking their brain tumors and coming in and they're just yes. doing the keto diet and i go yes. would you look at that i talked to you about this three years ago and you guys laughed at me um yes. Yes. but you know 
I knew, and it was funny, my mom's neurologist, Dr. Black was like, listen, we don't have a lot of research on it, but there's no harm in trying it. And I think that, you know, it could be helpful. And so we did it. Uh, but it was pretty funny. Um, I mean, it, yeah, I mean, it, it, it is one of those things where, where really our whole approaches are changing. Doctors are changing their thinking. There's a guy who's a Harvard psychiatrist who's using ketogenic diets to treat schizophrenia and depression, bipolar disease, and many other things. So the bottom line you should hear is that sugar and starch are the big drivers of so many diseases, including cancer, heart disease, diabetes, dementia, even psychiatric diseases. And the treatment is to cut it out. And it's also the key to longevity. Because if you want to live a short, sick life, eat a lot of sugar and starch. <laughs> if you want yeah. to live a long, healthy life, don't do that. Can your food council figure out how to ban all that horrible food marketing? Because it's well, so it's hard. it's on the when list for sure of things to do, for sure. It's so bad. It's so bad. Um, it's that old First Amendment thing that's the problem, you know, the freedom of speech. <laughs> I, I know. Like, I they know. Don't want to it. it's, it's unfortunate. I think I, at least the kids, we need to be thinking about this, at least for kids, because that's that's when they target them. That's when they get hooked. It's like easy to get customers early and keep for life by targeting little kids. Yeah, I know. What about, um, there's, you've been talking, you've talked about on your Instagram and in all of your books about insulin resistance. Can you explain yeah. insulin yeah. resistance to everyone? And then one of the things that I was so blown away by is that it's something that's going to eventually happen to everyone. And mm. I guess because we're eating sugar and starch, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, this is such a big problem. Maria. I think, you know, recent study came out from Tufts looking at metabolic health and found that 93.2% of Americans are metabolically unhealthy. That means only 6.8% of us are metabolically healthy. 6.8% yeah, of us are yeah. metabolically healthy. That's crazy. Yeah. And when when and I when saw means, that, I was like... It's crazy, right? And when it means you're metabolically healthy, it means you're not um, having any prediabetes or diabetes. If you're metabolically unhealthy, and that's over 93% of us, have some degree of insulin resistance, prediabetes, on the way to diabetes. I mean, 75% overweight, one out of two have prediabetes or diabetes in this country already. But if you if you look, why is it 93%? It's because even people who are thin and aren't overweight may be over fat. In other words, they may be skinny fat. They may have the same weight that they were when they were younger, but then the muscle is replaced by fat and then your metabolism is much slower and you're more pre-diabetic, even at the same weight. Mm -hmm. So this is important to realize. You can be thin and, you know, I'm thin, I can eat sugar, it doesn't bother me. Well, it does. It just doesn't bother you on the outside, it bothers you on the inside. And so when we look at what this means to be metabolically healthy, it means you have high blood sugar, high blood pressure, abnormal cholesterol, are overweight, or have had a heart attack or stroke, which, by the way, are all related to this poor metabolic health from eating too much starch and sugar. So what happens is, you know, typically as a species, we may, may have had 22 teaspoons of sugar a year. We found a little bit of honey somewhere. We get some, you know, some sweet berries or something in the summer. But here we just eat the average person eats 22 teaspoons a day and some kids eat 35 teaspoons and maybe average, average. That means some kids eat a lot more and some adults eat a lot more. And what that does is it just floods our system and that doesn't even count the starch, which is an, at least almost uh, another double that. And that that actually acts just like sugar in the body. It turns to glucose and that creates enormous downstream consequences of insulin resistance. So bread, potatoes, rice, starchy stuff. Some potatoes are okay, but like, you know, pasta, bread, rice, all that stuff is super refined and drives huge amounts of insulin production in the body in response to trying to keep your sugar low. And then the insulin causes you to store fat in your belly. It causes inflammation in those belly fat cells. It locks the fat inside of your cells so it can't get out and can't lose weight. It slows your metabolism down so you're already kind of screwed <laughs> on top of being screwed. And then you makes you more hungry so you want to eat more. And it causes you to lose more muscle, which leads to more vicious cycle. And then it lowers your hormones. So it lowers sex hormones. That's why men become impotent and have low testosterone. And they end up getting man boobs because their testosterone gets turned into estrogen. And so it's it's really a, a huge crisis of poor metabolic health and insulin resistance. And you can, you know, your doctor doesn't measure it. That's what's crazy. It's so easy and so inexpensive. It's like 10 bucks for a test and it's measuring your insulin level. If you measure just blood sugar, you're you're picking things up way down the, down the line. Meaning I mean, like your A1C. 
No, meaning like your fasting blood sugar or your A1C. Okay. So yeah. if you measure fasting blood sugar, it could be normal and you could be having hugely high uh, levels of insulin that are causing all these problems that you don't know because your blood sugar is normal. So I think it's important to check fasting insulin and ideally it should be less than five and you could, less than 10 is, you know, probably okay, but not really. And over that you're really in trouble. And I think, um, we, we don't test that and doctors don't look at it and doctors know how to treat insulin resistance. They don't really understand lifestyle diseases and how to treat them. They will we can give you medication. We'll give you metformin. I'm like, well, mm -hmm. okay, but that doesn't work as well as eating better and exercising. So why not focus on that? So I, th I think we, we are in a crisis. And, uh, and if you look at the phenomenon of aging, it is a phenomenally easy thing to understand that insulin resistance is at the root of so much of the aging process. It is what's underlying heart disease, cancer, dementia, diabetes. Can't, diabetes, uh, uh, type three diabetes is now what they call dementia. <laughs> so it's, this is a oh huge problem. And we, we, actually, we actually can fix it. It's not that hard. I had a patient I talked about in the book who was type two diabetic on insulin, massively overweight, uh, heart failure, everything. She was off her insulin in three days, reversed her diabetes from like extremely poor control and A1C of like 11 to five and a half. That's like a, a like going like from a sugar of like three, 400 to like normal. Was she type just one? A couple of months. Type two, type two. She was that on insulin. high of an A1C, wow. Yeah, she was type two. And she just ate crap and she ate processed food and she didn't know better. And it was, you know, she was relatively educated, but she didn't know better. And that led to, her just following these habits that were in her family forever and not taking care of herself. And once we taught her what to do, she did it and it radically changed everything for her. And she reversed her heart failure, her kidneys were failing, she reversed that, her liver was failing, she had high blood pressure, she had angina, heart failure, all of it reversed. And you don't see that with traditional medicine. You don't see you reversing heart failure, you reversing diabetes, no. reversing kidney failure. These are things you have to manage as chronic diseases and I don't want to manage anything. I want to get rid of it. <laughs> So it really, yeah. that's what's exciting I'm, is that I'm the same anywhere way. you are in the spectrum, whether you're like like you and I are relatively healthy, want to optimize our health, or there's someone with chronic diseases that you want to you know reverse them and 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 see if you can you know increase your overall vitality, health, and well-being, and, and get rid of some of the diseases and drugs you're on. This this works for all that all across the spectrum. So, question: If insulin resistance is such a problem and and the body's having to produce all this insulin for all the junk that we're eating mm -hmm. doesn't that mean that the pancreas just gets so tired and it that's kind of why it, it shifts the bet on us and we end up with diabetes yeah but see the thing is maria you don't have to have diabetes to have all these problems diabetes is affects you know about one in one in um one in ten so that's terrible but it's it's not the 93 percent uh, right, 90% of people don't have diabetes, but 93% have poor metabolic health. So it doesn't mean if you're diabetic or not, you're still you're still seeing all the disease of aging accelerate, all the health consequences of this accelerate. Obviously, if it's diabetes, it's worse, but that's sort of a very late stage phenomena. You want to you want to understand that you know this is something you have to get on early, mm -hmm. and but and 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 sort of stay on because this is the driver of aging. There was a, a professor of uh, Harvard who uh, Jorge Plutsky was the head of preventive cardiology. Goes, if you could take a group of hundred year old people and find one thing they all had in common, what would it be? And we, you know, but the answer is is they were insulin sensitive, meaning their bodies didn't need much insulin to keep their blood sugar normal, as opposed to most of us, which have a high level of insulin just to keep the blood sugar normal. So did I, do I remember this correctly? Didn't you say also that this is a cause of infertility for women? Oh my God. Yes. So, so we, we see a lot of infertility. One in seven couples are infertile. And, and there was actually a book written by some Harvard uh, uh, nutritionist, epidemiologist, uh, the head of the Harvard School of Public Health, Walter Willett, called the Fertility Diet, which was all about the, the role of sugar in causing infertility and poor metabolic health. And the extreme version of that is PCOS, which affects a lot of women. But even if you don't have that, it can still affect fertility. Also men too, it affects fertility, testosterone levels, sperm quality. So whether mm -hmm. you're a man or woman, it's really important. Sounds like why Kevin and I weren't able to get pregnant all those years. <laughs> mm -hmm. I bet. But nobody talks about that. Nobody... Mm -hmm. Nobody's ever made that connection. They they go and they give the guy the surgery. They pump yep. more hormones into you. Mm -hmm. And and yep. P.S. I was always pre diabetic, so that yep. could have been a very easy thing for somebody to identify and say, "Well, 
you know, instead of saying, let's get you on, oh, you have Hashimoto's, let's get you on a little Synthroid so you can get pregnant. That's what they did. Yeah. You actually could have just said, hey, cut the sugar. <laughs> totally. I mean, I, I have I have a wall in my office, a baby wall of pictures of all these women who are infertile and their babies when they were told they couldn't get pregnant. <laughs> so if you understand how to optimize the body and balance your hormones and deal with the disruption that comes from our processed diet and a few other things, it's amazing how many women who are infertile can become fertile, how many couples who are struggling to have babies can have babies. How long after someone cuts, let's just keep it simple, they cut sugar and starch, gluten, you know, they cut all the bad stuff. How mm -hmm. long before you see real change? Oh, wow. Well, that's that's a quite amazing. We had this woman, I was telling you, who was you know, body mass index 43, which is huge. Normal is 25, and 30 is considered obese. So 43 is just like, we call it severe obesity. And she was on insulin for 10 years. In three days, she was off her insulin to totally, and her blood sugars dropped, dropped down. Where type 2, though, anything. right? Type 2. Right, not type one. Type wow. one's an autoimmune disease. It affects very few people compared to type two. So three days of being on insulin for 10 years, she was able to get off of it using food as medicine. In three months, she was completely off all her drugs and medications for everything, including diabetes and the pills, as well as the shots of insulin. So, I mean, three days is pretty good. I, it, yeah. That's one thing about a lot of this. It doesn't take a long time to see real results if you know what to do. It's like, say, well, you know, that diet and lifestyle doesn't work. But sure, if I if I gave you, you know, a milligram of aspirin for your headache, you say, well, aspirin doesn't work. Well, you need 325 or 650 milligrams to get rid of your headache, not one milligram. So the dose, so the frequency, the type, all of it matters. And so it's not just about saying eat better and exercise. It's about the specifics that I go into in the book, Young Forever, that guys know exactly what to do to tune up your biology and your metabolism and, and to be able to actually live a long, healthy life. Yeah. Well, the other thing that I see a lot of is, is the bloated. So, well, this is a whole thing, right? I've been talking to people, even doctors. I go, if you have diarrhea consistently, there's a massive issue. And we kind of like are so scared to talk about poop, I think. And, um, and I feel like that's one thing that I'm realizing is like a big deal. Actually, your poop is, it matters. So let's totally. talk about poop. And then I want to talk about bloatedness because it's another thing that we've normalized. Oh, I'm just bloated. Yeah. I'm just bloated. And it's not normal. No. I mean, there's different kinds of bloating, right? People can have fluid retention and feel bloated because they're inflamed. And that just creates interstitial fluid, fluid in your tissues, and you get puffy, swollen, and that just I'm bloated. That's real. And that goes away in a few days of changing your diet and getting off inflammatory foods and eating whole foods. Um, and so the, 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 the second thing is actual digestive system bloating. And that often is what we call food baby, where you feel like you eat and your bum stomach blows up and you're uncomfortable or you have digestive symptoms, diarrhea, constipation. Uh, it's typically referred to as irritable bowel syndrome, but that means we don't know what causes it. In fact, we do. It can be overgrowth of what? bad bugs. Well, we do know it can be often caused by bad bugs growing in the small intestine called SIBO or overgrowth of yeast in the small intestine or in the gut called SIFO. And it all can be fit into food sensitivities, gluten, dairy. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons why people have, have gut issues. But when you actually uh, deal with how to create a healthy inner garden, which I describe in the book and give you a roadmap on how to optimize your gut health, often those symptoms will all go away. And like that woman I mentioned earlier, she had an irritable bowel, she had reflux for years and years on all the medications. And within a few days, she was better, literally a few days. And within six weeks, everything was gone. So the body has this ability to repair. We just got to kind of get out of the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And SIBO is super, uh, I know Kelsey deals with SIBO as well. Um, what are What are your kind of like top tips for that? Well, SIBO is just it's a very common problem. But you know, one of the one of the things I talk about in Young Forever in the book is how the microbiome is one of the hallmarks of aging. And that as our bi microbiome has become more unhealthy, the whole mess of bacteria in our gut, it creates more inflammation. And one of the things it leads to is what we call inflammaging, which is the inflammatory process of of our bodies that occurs when we get older and that 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 affects everything so it, there's a lot of things that cause it obviously the sugar but also the microbiome and so you have to learn how to optimize your microbiome and if you have SIBO which is bacterial overgrowth you have to treat it you have means maybe herbs maybe antibiotics you may need any fungals but then you figure out why is it because 
you you're do we treat it with wine too mark wine no wine will make it worse <laughs> No, you no drink cocktails. wine, if you have sugar, if you have starch, that all feeds the bad bugs. <laughs> so you want to starve them, uh, basically, yeah. by not eating all that crap. And they and the good bugs love lots of colorful phytochemicals, the medicine and foods. They love fiber. They love prebiotic foods, probiotic foods. So you can you can actually optimize your gut function pretty easily. Uh, sometimes you need medical care if there's a reason why you may need a prescription or something like that to get rid of it. You may need testing to see what's really going on. And if you have certain different kinds of SIBO, there's methane SIBO and hydrogen SIBO. It gets complicated, but the basic idea is you can reset your gut and kind of kind of re, re, re kind of reconstitute the soil. Let's say you have crappy soil somewhere. You can come in, you can put manure on, you put all the right things in the soil, and you can create a healthy soil. Same thing we need to do in our gut, and it may take a little time. But the body has an ability to do that. And then the Young Forever, I talked about how you optimize your microbiome for longevity, which is the same as optimizing it for everything else. So it should Yeah. Help. Well, I feel like I heard that the stomach lining changes naturally every 24 hours. Is that? Well, yeah, the epithelial right? lining, yeah, the, the service lining, the cells reproduce and you know, turn over. But most of the problems we, we do, we have such a bad intestinal environment that we have such bad bugs growing because of the wrong food or we 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 eaten so many toxins and chemicals it affects our gut so when you when you have that going on it creates this damage to the gut lining called leaky gut and then you get inflammation throughout the body you can get fluid retention autoimmune diseases uh, diabetes dementia cancer all of it can be related to heart disease to these bad bugs in the gut so wow. it's really an important mm. part of longevity but let's get back to the wine. If we heal the gut, can we go <laughs> back not. to having a glass? <laughs> like, do you drink ever? I do. I okay. do. But it's, I might have a glass of wine or two every few months. Like okay. if I go out to a dinner, there's somebody, you know, we're all sharing a bottle of wine. I'll have a little bit, but I almost never do. Uh, hard liquor, again, maybe once a month, I'll have a shot of tequila or, you know, go out with friends or something. But Really rarely. I think alcohol is, is increasingly becoming understood to increase the risk of all the age-related diseases. Obviously, it's not good for your brain and it promotes cancer risk. Uh, it actually can obviously affect your blood sugar, affect your microbiome, cause more inflammation. It's a toxin. And I think, you know, mm -hmm. if you want to enjoy it occasionally, I'm not opposed to it. It's just know what you're doing. Like if you want to have a cookie occasionally, fine. But it's a recreational drug. It's not a daily staple. And it's certainly not a health health promoting substance. And the yeah. data is becoming more and more clear about this. Well, because, you know, we hear, you know, even Dan Buettner was on the show and he's like, you know, in Acaria, they're, they're having their wine and they're fine because they are, they are, they are. but they're, they're doing all <laughs> the things right that we're not yeah, doing right. It's all the other things. It's like, is it the wine <laughs> or is it the fact that they, you know, there's something called a healthy user effect. The healthy user effect means, you know, uh, for example, this is, this is an example, but they did all these large studies on meat consumption and whether there were any health risks. And it was during a time when everybody thought the meat was bad for you. So the people who ate meat in the studies were more overweight. They ate 800 calories more a day. They ate less fruits and vegetables. They ate more processed food. They didn't exercise. They drank more and they smoked more. The people who didn't eat meat because they thought it was unhealthy exercised more, ate fruits and vegetables, were normal weight, didn't smoke, didn't drink. So was it the meat? Or was it the other other factors? Yeah. Right? So the same thing happened with women's hormones. I mean, the, the nurses' health study, the women's health study, um, nurses' health study showed that women who took hormones had less heart disease, dementia, cancer, everything. Uh, and it wasn't who because took synthetic they were hormones? taking the hormones. They were taking Premer and other things. But the, these, this is a big population study looking at what happens in a population when women were taking hormones back in the you know 70s and 80s and so forth and they found that the, that the risks were down for all these diseases but then they said well this isn't actually a cause and effect study it's a, it's a it's an observational study we can look for correlations but not causation so let's do a randomized controlled trials a women's health initiative billion dollar study 100 over 160,000 women and they randomized them to no hormones or hormones and they had to stop the study because women who were getting the hormones were dying left and right and getting cancer and stroke and heart disease. So it wasn't the hormones that were protecting these women in the first study. It was their overall lifestyle because they went to the doctor. They were more attentive to their health. They, that's why they got prescribed hormones because they went to the doctor. So I, I think it's really very important to understand that that you have to look carefully at the data and where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. And the alcohol data, you know, were really around some of these sort of population-based things where people had healthier lifestyles, but it's not, it's not a 
cause and effect. Drinking wine isn't yeah. equal longevity. It's the opposite. Well, our lives in America are very different than they are in Ikaria. So yeah, and, that is a big it's deal. True. And I was in Ikaria this last summer and I drank the wine and I went and saw the, how they made the wine. And the wine was made from these special grapes that are growing in very harsh conditions and have you know, profound levels of phytochemicals that are protective. They're also not processed with sulfites. They're, they're not preserved. They, they go bad. They, they had the guy, the guy who had him like, you know, in these big vats and these clay pots underneath the ground, you know, it was really quite interesting to see what he did. And it was, it was these old methods that had been used for thousands of years. So, I mean, in that case, you know, who knows, maybe a little bit is fine, but it, you know, not the kind of stuff we're typically drinking. Yeah. Um, I also have to ask you um, that, well, by the way, as we were talking about meat, I remember something else I read in this book that if you eat too much red meat, it raises your glucose. I, I don't think I said that in the book, but what what, what happens is if, if you if you are um, overdosing on protein, it can actually turn into sugar. Or if your That's body is eating sugar, if you're if you're actually eating a lot of um, uh, you know not eating enough calories, right? If you're starving, your body will turn protein into sugar. So the body can can actually make sugar out of protein that you eat. But that's not really what happens, right? So you should be yeah. eating a protein in the right amount. So you don't want to overdose, but you don't want to underdose. And protein is really important as we get older to build muscle. Because the, mo the most important thing that we can do as we get older is make sure we eat and exercise in a way that optimizes our muscle mass, which means low sugar, more protein, and then resistance training. And, and that's really key to building muscle and maintaining muscle because without muscle, we can't function without our muscle, we become frail and decrepit and end up in nursing homes. It's not because we have an illness, it's because we can't tie our shoes or, you know, walk without a walker, right? And when these mm -hmm. people, you know, in, in Icaria and in and, and, and Sardinia where I was, they didn't have walkers. <laughs> they yeah. Were, they were, you know, running around the mountains and they were like 90 years old. I'm like, well, okay, yeah. I can't keep yeah. up with you. Slow down. My 98-year-old <laughs> grandmother would carry water jugs that were as tall as her from the village fountain to our house yep. Yep. where we were. Um yep. How did you heal your gastritis specifically? Uh, well, I had speaking for a friend. Yeah, speaking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> Asking for a friend. Well, I think it's a combination of things. I really, uh, you know, work on the food part and understand that a lot of the restoration of microbiome has to do with with make sure you're eating a lot of polyphenols. These colorful plant compounds that the bacteria love. Lots of pre and probiotic fibers, but I also you know, use uh, other things that could help me that were a little bit more aggressive that probably are not accessible to most people right now, but things like ozone and exosomes uh, and peptides that really help reset my gut. Uh, and now I'm perfect. So uh, it really, it was quite amazing to be, you know, you know, not responding to any treatments, to be in bed for five months, to be having 20 bloody balance a day, and then being perfectly normal, which is from a, from a medical perspective, it's not possible. You don't, you put That's what I was just going to say. Right, right? They tell you that this is unhealable. I'm like, wait, everything's no, no. healable. Well, I think if you know what to do, right. If I said, well, yeah. you know, I want, I want to get to the moon. You're like, you're fucking nutcase. Cause if it's like, you know, 1901, you're like, well, I'm going to get to the moon, but now we know how to get to the moon. Well, okay. We can get to the moon. You know, it's Somebody a, a complicated, it. you know how to do it. It's like, so I think, I think, you know, you're nuts. If you, if you, if you have a perspective that it's not possible, but if you understand how to get from here to there, which is the roadmap of functional medicine and the roadmap that I use in the young forever in the book to help people understand how to optimize their health for a long and healthy life, then it's not hard. It's just yeah. following, it's following the instruction manual for your body. That's what young forever is. It's like the owner's manual. How many of you got an owner's manual when you were born? Probably not too many. How yeah. does your body work? How do you optimize it? What goes wrong? How do you tweak it? You know, if you're, car has low tires, you don't want to put air in it. If the car's low in gas, you put gas in it. If it's low in oil, you put oil in You, you kind of know more about what to do about maintaining your car uh, and the tune-up you need and spark plug. Well, we need the same thing for your body. Uh -huh. It's just we don't ever learn how to do that. I say it all the time. I'm like, we grow up from the time we're born. It's like, grow up, get good grades, achieve, win, go to a great school, make mm. a lot of money out of college, get married, have kids, health. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Never yeah. even in the equation. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple quick questions before we go. Stevia, you said artificial sweeteners are bad. Is stevia part of that group? Listen, I think I think that you know, it's interesting. As you start to look at you know uh, telling people to reduce sugar and starch, immediately they start going, "Well, 
can I have this? Can I have stevia? What about, you know, Nutrisweet? What about sucralose? What about sugar alcohols? What about monk fruit? What about this? What about stevia? And I think when I hear that question, immediately I realize they have an addiction, uh, that they are biologically addicted to sugar and starch, and that their brain is immediately trying to find ways around it. And so that's not bad. It means something, something wrong with you. It just means you need to recognize that as, as, oh, wow, why am I thinking that way? Is that because I'm hooked? And maybe I should see what happens if I get unhooked. And the reality is within, you know, two or three days, you stop wanting sugar. You, mm -hmm. you live, if you get your gut sorted, which if you have a ton of yeast, you might want sugar. But if you get your gut sorted and you reset your diet. And I wrote a whole book about how to detox from sugar called the 10-Day Detox Diet, which I encourage people to use if they want to reset their metabolism. In 10 days, you won't believe the changes that can happen. Uh, but it, but and it's very similar to what I have in the book Young Forever, but because what works works. Uh, but I think that that um, it's important to kind of not uh, you know kind of sort of focus on all these other kinds of sugar. If you want to have a little sugar once in a while, fine. Stevia is probably the most benign. Monk fruit and stevia are probably the most benign. But it still is very stimulating to your brain, and you have you know sweet receptors on your tongue. It communicates with the nerves in your in your tongue and that those go to your brain and you, you know, it sets up a whole cycle of, of, of craving for sugar. So I encourage people to try to not do that occasion. If you like it, fine, but it's, it's really, you know, I, I take people in this, you know, week long retreat and we get them off sugar and they have zero, like zero sugar, super low starch and, you know, really good quality fats and protein, lots of veggies. And then like the last day we give them like a chia seed pudding, that's sweetened with like coconut milk with no actual sugar and some berries. And they were like, oh my God, this is like the sweetest thing ever. This is like, <laughs> it feels like candy. Right? Yeah. But if you're drinking cola and you eat a blueberry, it feels like cardboard, right? Yeah, I know. Well, it's funny because I, um, I remember I think it was around the holidays. I saw your um, chocolate mousse pudding dessert with the avocado. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm like, I have to try this. So I adjusted it. I even removed the agave. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm doing zero sugar. And yeah. I just did the coconut cream, the avocado, and the um, cacao. And it was delicious. Yeah, it's good. And right? oh my God, it's amazing. And I was like, I can have a dessert. This is so exciting. And I don't even care about desserts. I quit desserts three years ago. So I've yeah. really gotten past that. But now where my diet's really gotten so into just protein and vegetables, you know, once in a while, you want to feel like you had a little something interesting. Um, so I was like, oh, this is good. Um, yeah, for sure. We've also recently come across the spice issue. And you talk about spices in the supermarket in here. Where should people get good quality spices that are not toxined? That's not a word, but I just um, created it. <laughs> that are not toxic. Well, I think, you know, Toxin. I most stores like Whole Foods and so forth. I think you, you want to make sure you get the organic ones. Um just because of the way they can sometimes grow them with a lot of toxins and pesticides. So you may be doing good by eating spices, but then if they're full of pesticides, it's probably not a good idea. Yeah. So they say organic on the spices. I've never looked until yeah, recently yeah, I've heard yeah, about they this. Have, they have organic spices for sure. Okay. Yeah. Do you have a yeah. favorite organic green tea? Uh, do I have a favorite organic green tea? There's so many good brands out there now. Um, uh, I'm blinking on the brands, but I, I just, <laughs> I don't have a brand in mind, but I, you know, I just go to the store and I look your next like, Instagram post. Yeah, you go. <laughs> what brand? I mean, <laughs> it, it just people are, are very, uh, you know, very good out there making all kinds of great products that are healthy and that are, you know, moving things down the road in a, in a good way. So, well, friends, the book is called young forever. I loved it. I cannot recommend it enough. Um, I have so many notes in here and I'm photocopying so many, I'm photocopying mm. your shake recipe mm. or smoothie mm. recipe and all of the, um, phytonutrients that we need to be eating. Right. Because yeah. we can also get so stuck in our habits of the same foods yeah. all the time. We need to be no, incorporating variety, all these different things. For sure. You want to have absolute variety. It's so key. So and I talk about all the different, thing. like there's a whole chart of all the different fruits and vegetables and mushrooms and things and what the molecules are in them. What are the medicines in them? What do they do? And so you yeah. can start to kind of Some like, of them are like anti-cancer. Yeah. You wrote that all in specifically, which was great. Yeah. Great. Maria, can I ask one uh, question? Right. Yeah. Dr. Hyman, what are, if you were to tell us that like we need to take 
two to three supplements. I feel like supplements are so like thrown in our faces and like it's so overwhelming. Are there like a handful that you're like, they're, we all must be taking them like a probiotic or a D like, what would you say? Yeah, I think, I think, you know, I talk a lot about supplements young forever and one of the Mm -hmm. foundational ones and one of the sort of value add ones. So the foundational ones, everybody needs is vitamin D, a fish oil, a good multi, and usually people need magnesium. Those are kind of non-negotiables. And then there's all the fun stuff you can explore like NMN and quercetin and green tea extract pills and broccoli extract pills and curcumin from turmeric, which are very inflammatory that help in longevity Fisetin, which is a strawberry extract that kills all the zombie cells. So there's all kinds of fun stuff to do. Um, Urolithin A, which comes from pomegranate that has powerful effects on rejuvenating your mitochondria. And I talk about what those are if people want to be more adventurous in the book or they have a little extra uh, they want to spend on that. But I, I think for most people, for a dollar a day, you can get your basic needs met with a good multi fish oil and vitamin D. And that'll, that'll take care of 90% of what you need. Very cool. So helpful. Um, Thank you. All right. A lot of amazing info on how to reverse our ailments. I know that I, like I said, have dog-eared this entire book and have so many things that I'm going to implement. That's what I love about this show is we get new, 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 new tools, <laughs> new, new tools, yeah, new, new, new tools. tools, but new, new tools every day. And, uh, and so many helpful tips, but also just kind of the overall thought of no matter how deep you are, you can clean climb out. And that's what really spoke to me last night when I was reading the book and then also um, just chatting with him throughout. And he does spell everything out in this book. Um, And anything that I had a question on, I got in, which I'm really happy about, especially like the hyperbaric stuff, because I feel like a lot of people who are dealing with cancer um, are always questioning whether that's good or not. But you notice at the end, he said, I would start with other things first. Definitely. I had never even heard, like I know hyperbaric, but I never even heard that there was controversy around that. So that was really interesting to mm-hmm. me. And the ozone well, stuff, I used to do ozone. I have like a little ozone machine. So I'm going to start doing that again. No way. Yeah. I used to, there was a guy I saw in Seattle when I had, when my SIBO was really bad and he had me sit in like this egg that was like an ozone egg. And yeah. And then he had me get this little machine. So I was like, ah, I got to start doing that again. Interesting. Yeah. Queen, may I add, you look super cute today. Thank I love you. your hair. Your skin's glowing, a little fuzzy sweater. It's all Thank working. You. Thank you. It was funny because I had my hair down and then I was like, no, I feel like this kind of is a cute little updo with the sweater. So thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, that was fun. He's, <laughs> and I, I agree, Maria. I think it's always really nice to hear from these experts who he was saying he had all these issues just five years ago mm-hmm. and he was able to come out of it. So I love hearing um, that from them. I think it just helps a lot. It it helps me feel more. It's like, it's just relatable. I'm like, Oh, okay. He can do it. We can do it. We can do it. Queen. We can do it for sure. And you can do it. Heal squad as well. We'll put links to everything in the summary of this episode. In the meantime, if you have not checked out Monday motivations and intentions, we do like a five to 10 minute little, um, podcast to start your week off. Right with uh with something that you know will hopefully inspire you some life advice some mantras very quick very digestible start your monday off right start your week off right monday motivations and intentions on apple podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts in the meantime be nice people make good choices and be present this podcast and all related content published or distributed by or on behalf of Maria Menunos or mariamenunos.com is for informational purposes only and may include information that is general in nature and that is not specific to you. Any information or opinions expressed or contained herein are not intended to serve as or replace medical advice, nor to diagnose, prescribe, or treat any disease, condition, illness, or injury, and you should consult the healthcare professional of your choice regarding all matters concerning your health, including before beginning any exercise, weight loss, or healthcare program. If you have or suspect you may have a healthcare emergency, please contact a qualified healthcare professional for treatment. Any information or opinions provided by a guest expert or host featured within website or on company's podcast are their own, not those of Maria Menounos or the company. Accordingly, Maria Menounos and the company cannot be responsible for any results or consequences or actions you may take based on information or opinions.